Good evening, I'm Mark Updegrove, the director of the LBJ Library, and on behalf of my friend Don Carlton, the executive director of the Briscoe Center for American History, I want to welcome you to Behind the Lens White House Photography from LBJ to Obama. Don will be on stage later this evening to moderate a panel uh, a discussion with our, our speakers. But I want to let you know this will be the, the debut of an alliance that the LBJ uh, Library has struck up with the Briscoe Center. And in the spring, we'll be teaming up for uh, uh, some events and, and programming and a temporary exhibit around the life and legacy of Walter Cronkite. We hope you'll come back for, for that and <laughs> some UT graduates. Um, we hope you'll come back for, for that and some of the other wonderful things going on here at the LBJ Library. Back in 1860, Abraham Lincoln chalked up his White House victory to two things. The, the speech that he made at Cooper Union, the famous house divided speech, and the photographs of Matthew Brady. Since that time, photography of our presidents has become more revealing but no less powerful. Tonight, on the year anniversary of Barack Obama's historic inauguration, four chief White House photographers will unite for the first time to share their thoughts, stories, and work relating to our modern presidents. But as it happens, we also have a fifth White House photographer here tonight. Frank Wolf served as Lyndon Johnson's White House photographer and afterward came here to the LBJ Library where he worked for 20 years and helped to establish uh, uh, with a number of other great folks this great institution. As you walked in tonight, you saw some of the wonderful work that Frank did during his tenure both in the White House and with the library. So please join me in welcoming Frank who will in turn welcome our panelists. Thank you, Mark. It's wonderful to be back in familiar surroundings among friends. When David called me about this, he told me he was organizing a group of former White House photographers to show their work and participate in a panel discussion. I told him I'd done that a few times and it wasn't a role I found myself comfortable in. He said, Frank, you're the senior White House photographer. How about introducing us? David, I want to thank you wherever you are for pointing out my seniority. <laughs> I've been keenly aware of it ever since. Fifty years ago, I reported to the White House Army Signal Agency. Dwight Eisenhower was president, and a headline in the Washington Post read, Cadillacs and Concubines. I had no idea what the next ten years had in store. During those years, I had the good fortune to work with Yoichi Okamoto. Oki undertook the most comprehensive photographic documentation of a president up to this time. No one had ever tried anything like it. It took Oki's skill, perseverance, and creativity, along with Lyndon Johnson's sense of history, appreciation for photojournalism, and more than anything, his trust of Oki and his staff. There might have been some vanity somewhere in that mix. <laughs> but it was more than just vanity on the part of LGJ that made it work. White House photography would never go back to the grips and grins of previous administrations. It's my understanding that we'll see some of Okamoto's work later on in the presentation. Tonight, we are privileged to welcome four world-class photographers to the stage. Each is an accomplished photojournalist in his own right. And cumulatively, they have spent thousands of hours alongside the most powerful men in America, capturing the daily moments of the presidency. It's my pleasure to introduce them. David Hume Kennelly has been shooting on the front lines of history for more than 40 years. The arresting photos he took in Vietnam won the Pulitzer Prize for feature photography in 1972. He returned stateside in 1973 to cover the political drama playing out in, the Was in Washington for Time magazine. 
Following Nixon's resignation, Kennelly was named Chief White House Photographer during the Ford Administration. His archives now reside in the Briscoe Center. David Valdez, a native Texan, became personal photographer to then Vice President George Bush in 1983 and became director of the White House Photo Office in 1988 when Bush was elected president. Since then, he has worked for Walt Disney Attractions, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and most recently, he founded a photography consulting group based in Annapolis, Maryland. Bob McNeely bought his first camera while serving in the Army in Southeast Asia in 1968. In 1972, he joined McGovern's national campaign staff and moved to Washington, D.C., where he made his base for 30 years. Bob worked in the Carter White House from 1977 to 1980, and in 1982 was asked to become the Clinton campaign photographer and later the personal photographer of the president. He worked in the White House until 1998 when he left to publish his book, The Clinton Years. One year ago tonight, he photographed the inauguration of Barack Obama with David Hume Kennelly. Eric Draper served as a special assistant to the president and White House photographer for George W. Bush. Draper documented the, the entire eight years of the Bush administration and directed the con conversion of the White House photo office from film to digital. Prior to joining the White House, Eric served as an Associated Press photographer covering presidential campaigns, the 2000 Summer Olympics, the Kosovo, Kosovo conflict, and the 1988, excuse me, 1998 World Cup in France. Gentlemen, I turn the stage to you. Well, Uptegrove said we'd have a good turnout tonight, and he was certainly correct. Um, two very good friends of mine, uh, Mark Uptegrove and Dr. Don Carlton. Uh, Don convinced me to get my archive out of the garage and down to the University of Texas at the uh, Dolph Briscoe Center for American History, which is where it is. And uh, I'm really happy to have this evening tonight with some of my colleagues. Uh, it's a small group. And thank you, Frank, for the, uh, the introduction. So each of us is gonna show some pictures, talk a little bit about our presidents, uh, the ones we got to know so well and photograph. And uh, I'm gonna open it up by going back and giving you a kind of a quick magical mystery tour of uh, presidential photography. This uh, first picture I did not take. Uh, <laughs> although I've been, I was the assistant to Matthew Brady. But this is the photo he took uh, that President Lincoln referred to uh, just prior to the Cooper Union speech. He took it in a studio in New York City. And Abraham Lincoln really was the first president who understood the power of photography. And you have to go quite a bit later on to find another person who absolutely understood it. The first modern president was JFK. He knew that his family and his image was uh, uh, very attractive to photographers. And he had a lot of um, uh, outside photographers coming in, Mark Shaw, Jacques Lowe, Stanley Tredick. These, this was a campaign picture, actually. It was him as a senator. It was widely uh, published. And you know the situation, but you probably haven't seen this picture. This is by Stanley Tredick. And one, I love the shot that the, underneath the president's feet are some of John Kennedy Jr.'s uh, shoes. And John, J John Jr. and I worked together uh, when he was publishing George magazine. And that's the picture you, you've all seen, a very famous picture by Stanley Tredick. But the Kennedys had a, a remarkably uh, good affinity with still photography particularly, and uh, both the president and Mrs. Kennedy let these guys come in. But uh, as Frank uh, uh, was in the military early on, the official duties of the White House photographer were by the military people. 
This is Lyndon Johnson, Kennedy, and uh, I think Walter, uh, some of you in here would know him. Uh, actually, I, I showed a picture of Martha Mitchell to a class here at UT the other day, and only three people knew who it was, so I can't feel too bad here. Uh, but these photos were by Jacques Lowe, really beautiful photos. And this one is by um, uh, George Thames, who's a New York Times photographer, a very famous picture. And this transitions into uh, a moment was taken by Cecil Stoughton, who was in the, uh, the Army. Uh, this was after JFK was assassinated on Air Force One. A very memorable photo. This is probably top 10 in pictures that you would remember uh, that you've seen in your life. And he brought in Okamoto. Uh, Johnson was not satisfied with the pictures he was getting from the military, but uh, to their, uh, uh, in their defense, the military photographers really weren't given access, so they didn't have a, they didn't have a fluid relationship. But um, President Johnson brought in Okamoto, who I and I think my colleagues uh, really feel was the uh, the godfather of modern presidential photography. I've visited the archive here at the LBJ Library, and um, it's just an astonishing set of photos. And Oki really laid down the uh, the gauntlet for the rest of us in terms of how you would do this. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I never photographed Lyndon Johnson, which was unfortunate, but everybody who did, and I knew a lot of guys who did, said that uh, he was really one of their favorite subjects. Very dramatic fellow. <laughs> with his dog. And, but you can see Oki was just getting in close, getting uh, right up, up close and personal, really, with Martin Luther King or any, any kind of big meeting. Uh, with William Westmoreland on Vietnam, and even noticing other things like the grandchild, uh, one of his grandkids in the Oval Office. And this picture was taken by Jack Keitlinger, who was on the photo staff, uh, listening to a, a, a tape sent by Chuck Robb um, uh, from Vietnam. It's a very famous picture. Jack Keitlinger and his wife, unfortunately, were killed in a car wreck a, a few months ago. Jack worked with me on the White House staff during President Ford. And this is the most famous picture of Nixon, actually, which is, <laughs> somebody called it a pair of kings, but I don't know. <laughs> this is the largest, the biggest selling photograph in the Nixon uh, library. And um, uh, I can see why. but. There was, a, toward the end of the Nixon administration, Ollie Atkins was the second person to become the White House photographer. Ollie had been with Saturday Evening Post, and this looks like a really happy moment, but it wasn't. This is right after President Nixon told his family that he was resigning the president's, uh, presidency on August 7th of 1974. This is in the White House solarium, which is on the third floor of the White House. And Ollie's picture, uh, uh, this one really got a lot of play. Ollie was never given much access. In fact, could be told to leave by anybody, but mainly by the president himself. But these photographs of Nixon uh, even cropped. Uh, this picture was, this is, uh, I went through the Nixon archive and Trisha on the left is cropped. It's almost like Ollie didn't want to show the emotion of the moment. And unfortunately, I was never able to talk to him about these. Moments of Ziegler and, uh, and everything was taken at arm's length over this couple of days period. Even Vice President Ford waiting outside the Oval Office. And again, kind of from the back of the room, you could see the distance here. But Ollie had a tough go of it. He had a very difficult boss. And this was right before Ollie was, or before Nixon was resigning. This is August 8th, 1974, shot through the Oval Office window by another photographer. That's Ollie on the right. But this video uh, that was taken just prior to Nixon going on the air and, and uh, announcing that he was leaving really kind of sums up uh, what Ollie had to deal with during his time. Ollie? Yes. No. Only the CBS crew now is to be in this room oh, during this. Only the crew. I'm talking about this. No, there, no, there will be no picture. Yes. No. After the broadcast, you've taken your picture. Didn't, didn't you take one just now? Yes. That's it. Uh, because you know we don't want it. We, we didn't let the the, the press is going to take one. So you've taken it and you just take it right now. This is right after the broadcast. You got it? Come on. 
Okay. Well, I, I am sympathetic to Ollie. I've worked with him. Uh, that was really scary to me as a White House photographer. I mean, he actually worked for President Nixon. And this was the last shot that Ollie took from the helicopter. And this is where I come into the picture. These are my photos of uh, Nixon uh, uh, taking off from the helicopter. A series of photos. I was just back in the press pool, but I'd been covering President, then Vice President Ford for Time Magazine. This is a close-up of one of the frames. And with David uh, Eisenhower, Julie Eisenhower, the president, or Vice President Mrs. Ford, he would become president just minutes later. And I, I did a book uh, for with uh, Don Carlton and the Center for American History uh, about my period in the Ford White House. And uh, what happened with me was, uh, actually I'll go back one, um, the night he became president, the President Ford and I actually sat down and had a conversation at his house. I was invited as a guest. And I knew what had happened to Ollie. I mean, Ollie uh, was, ex was the poster child for what I didn't want to have happen to me if I was going to go work in the White House. And so um, the President asked me, well, how do you see this White House photographer's job? And I said, well, it's, if I'm going to do it, uh, I need total access and oh, I would only work for you directly, not for the press secretary or anybody. He kind of looked at me, he was puffing on his pipe, he said, you don't want Air Force One on the weekends? <laughs> and, um, but we arrived at a conclusion and I had remarkable access. It almost, it was the same as, uh, as uh, Okamoto had and it was, uh, uh, was a not as dramatic figure, but a wonderful person. And this is me on Air Force One, actually. Uh, but early on, you can see the Nixon stuff is all taken out of the Oval Office. This is right after he became president. A new, whole new feeling in there. This is uh, George Bush, uh, who was then the Republican National Committee, one of the early meetings with President Ford. And right after Ford pardoned Nixon, this is a down the hall and the Nixon picture is still on the wall and Ford's VP uh, uh, photo is there. I showed this picture to Alan Greenspan and he said, as usual, I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> and, uh, but he certainly carried that forward in his later career. Uh, to, uh, next to the president is Donald Rumsfeld and stubbing out a cigarette is Dick Cheney. The reason the dog was looking at me, this is Liberty, the golden retriever, she couldn't stand the pants, is what I guess, but <laughs> the, the 70s was a really bad period for uh, attire. And yeah, this is Mrs. Ford when she got out of the hospital uh, after her mastectomy. Uh, we had a wonderful relationship. Uh, for me, it was an upstairs, downstairs kind of relationship where I could go equally between the east and west wings. This kind of shows our relationship. This is actually the same room where Nixon had uh, said he was resigning. And with me and President Ford on the left is Terry O'Donnell, who was a close aide to the president. O'Donnell and I, the chief of staff, have spent more time with him than anybody, probably. This is a rare photograph of Henry Kissinger listening to somebody. <laughs> this is your power angle if you're a photographer. And in this room, uh, the plug was pulled on American involvement in Vietnam under a, a portrait of Teddy Roosevelt, very ironic moment. The, this is the National Security Council. I had a top secret clearance. I was in every meeting that happened. Actually, uh, there's a Texan in there, Bill Clements, who was the Deputy Secretary of Defense at the time. And Bill Colby, the head of the CIA, this is an extremely top secret meeting about rescuing the crew of the Mayaguez, Americans who've been captured in uh, Cambodia on a ship, and it showed when a, the island assault by the Marines was happening, so this was the kind of access I had, and I had a military uh, people at the lab who all had top secret clearances, and they were uh, processing these photos. And during, President Ford, during that moment, George Bush uh, was appointed to be CIA uh, director by, uh, by President Ford. This is Dick Cheney in the room with, uh, uh, this is uh, during the evacuation of Lebanon, another top secret meeting. Uh, I, one of my friends called this a meeting of the Godfathers. It's like <laughs> Reagan said, um, well, Nancy and I will take everything west of the Mississippi. This is when Reagan was, uh, 
was governor of California and later ran against Ford. This picture is the one that kept Ford off the best dress list with Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> Rumsfeld probably still has the same suit as he was wearing there. 1974 in Japan uh, with Brezhnev. Uh, this is a coat that was uh, given to President Ford, a wolf coat. And one of the advantages, and the other guys would tell you this, uh, uh, is getting close to world leaders, Brezhnev, Deng Xiaoping, Anwar Sadat. Um, this, this bears a little explaining. Um, this was a state dinner in Kyoto. Uh, it's the kind of state dinner Bill Clinton would have killed for, no doubt, <laughs> with geishas. And... Uh, <laughs> McNeely knows that's true. Uh, this is the Japanese version of our pass the apple underneath your uh, arm. It's like with a, with a straw with Rumsfeld and a different spin on it. And Henry Kissinger. This is not Henry's favorite political photo. I and then uh, backstage at the convention, uh, Ford had just beaten Reagan for the uh, Republican nomination. This is what I saw. This is uh, outside then uh, with Bob Dole was running mate. And then a very sad moment. This was after Carter beat Ford. This is in the Oval Office. And Mrs. Ford, as usual, was being uh, the cheerleader. In the moment where Jimmy Carter uh, was congratulated by President Ford, this is Carter's first visit ever to the White House, and he was uh, as the president-elect. Mrs. Ford always liked this picture, looking out toward the Oval Office of the West Lane, Wing, uh, uh, and I was—I took it. She didn't know I was in the room, but on the day before they left office, Mrs. Ford made a little tour of the West Wing and uh, was shaking hands with people and saying goodbye. And we went by the cabinet room, which is this male-dominated uh, uh, place. And she was a Martha Graham dancer and a mischievous kind of person. She said, you know, I've always wanted to dance on the cabinet room table. And um, <laughs> this is pre-Photoshop, by the way, so. And then the moment where Carter became president, the chief justice, and this is President Ford looking out on the Capitol. Uh, this is the place where he had uh, spent all those years, uh, was a, became a member of Congress, Congress in 1948. And then his funeral, I was the official White House, uh, or the official family photographer for the funeral going into the uh, House of Representatives side of the Capitol in a picture I took from the top of the dome. And five presidents, the first time five presidents had been together was at the Reagan Library uh, opening in 1991. And the last time was this one, the Oval Office, uh, uh, President-elect Obama with the Bushes, uh, Clinton, and uh, Carter. Thank you very much. I'm gonna pass it now to David. Thank you. <clears throat> David Valdez, uh, who was the first George Bush's uh, photographer. Thank you, Dave. It's always fun to be with you. It's rare that I get to be the younger guy. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I spent almost 10 years with the Bushes. I, I started out, um, uh, well, let's go back a little bit. I'm a Texan. And, and uh, when, when I was, uh, when George Bush was vice president, I heard that there was an opening, and I said, well, I can do that. At the time, I was chief photographer for Nation's Business Magazine, published there in Washington, D.C., and, and I said, well, l l let, me, let me see what I can do. I, I think I can do this job. So uh, I sought out who the press secretary was, because I knew the photographer, for the vice president um, uh, was going to hire the photographer, so I went in and and wrote a letter to Shirley Green, who was the press secretary at the time, and she called me in and and I made the short stack. She says, "Oh, another Texan," and and um, and so it was it was uh, uh, a pretty easy interview. I got called back and was interviewed with with. Uh, Admiral Murphy, who was the chief of staff, and he was a real stern, retired admiral, and he really just beat me up in this interview. 
And I thought, there is no way I'm gonna get this job. Well, then I got called back to meet and interview with Vice President Bush. So I went back and, and he was um, uh, very gracious and, and it's, it's kind of the theme of the whole, my whole experience with, with the Bush family. And he was telling me, well, you know, here's some pictures of, of you know, Barbara Bush and some of the grandchildren and you're gonna spend a lot of time with me. And, and I said, boy, this is, this is really great, but no one has yet said what the salary is. <laughs> And I said, do, do you know what the salary is? And he said, I have no idea. And he said, let me, let me call Admiral Murphy. Well, this is in the old executive office building and, and uh, Admiral Murphy's office was next door and he, Vice President picked up the phone. He says, hey, I'm in here with Dave Valdez and, and uh, he wants to know what the salary is. Well, through the walls, I could hear him screaming, saying, what, you know, he's asking you about the salary. So I thought, oh, geez. But, but, uh, I, I, I knew that, you know, some of the photographers that had preceded me, David uh, was classic, uh, uh, you know, I was always inspired by his access and I knew that that's what I um, wanted to have that same ability and I'll never forget literally my first day on the job, uh, we were down in Miami and, and um, uh, his son Jeb uh, and and his wife uh, Columba had just had a baby and and uh, he was meeting the baby for the first time and and uh, we were in this hotel in Miami Beach and Jeb brings in the new grandson and and for some reason Jeb had to leave and so they le he left uh, the baby with with Vice President Bush and myself in this hotel room. <laughs> So, so I thought, well, you know, I was looking around, you know, waiting, because it was literally my first day on the job. And I was looking around like, now what? And, and so he went back into the bedroom and there was no one to say, no, don't do that. So I went into the bedroom and I took some pictures and a few weeks later, um, uh, I got a note from Barbara Bush and, and she said, Dave, I, I love the photos you took of uh, uh, little Jeb and, and, and George. And um, as long as you take pictures of my grandchildren, you can go anywhere and photograph anything. So that was my opening and I kept that note. <laughs> when um, David was talking about the five presidents and the photo that he took outside, I actually took this photo inside the uh, uh, Reagan Library. They had a mock-up of the Oval Office and uh, uh, George Bush at the time was the president and, and they were waiting to go out to do the photo opportunity for the media and, and, and so they were just standing there and I said to George Bush, I said, hey, Mr. President, why don't you turn around for a quick shot? Well, when I said, hey, Mr. President, <laughs> they, they all turned and, and I got this, I got this shot. We, we went to, uh, we also, so that was the opening of the Reagan Library. This is the opening of the Nixon Library and the fellow over there on, on the left side of the screen is Marlon Fitzwater and Marlon was the press secretary to President Reagan and the only one to be also press secretary for another president, George Bush. And uh, Marlon actually uh, uses this photo quite a bit uh, 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 promoting himself, but you know, it was, <laughs> It was one of those uh, neat little moments. Working for Vice President Bush was, was great because I had a chance to be around uh, President Reagan in the Oval Office a little bit. And this is actually um, uh, former President Reagan leaving and the new, newly uh, sworn in President Bush and back in the back are the quails. And, and so they're, they're departing and, and leaving. Um, and here's... Uh, uh, Nancy Reagan kissing uh, uh, Barbara Bush goodbye and, and President Reagan going off into history. When um, uh, we were down in Houston 
when Vice President Bush was elected president, and 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 it was really interesting uh, for me. You know, everybody said, "Oh, you know, you've been with the Bushes for so many years. Don't worry, you'll become the president's photographer." And and uh, you know, I said, "Well, you know, it it the offer hasn't come, and and until the offer does come." I have to assume that that I'm going to leave, and and so this this was in Houston on on inauguration day or on election day, and and um, um, a few months later we were at an event in Washington D.C. and and uh, the president elect invited me to ride in his limo back to the vice president's house, and as we were doing that uh, he he said hey you know I. I would like you to be, uh, you know, my photographer and run the White House photo office. And I said, oh, you know, this is a great honor, um, but I was kind of holding out for an ambassadorship. <laughs> the, the, the Secret Service agent, literally, I, I, he, he, I thought they were going to die right there. Uh, th this is on election day with, with some of the grandchildren over at the Blair House, which is the guest house across the street from the White House where the president-elect stays before they uh, get sworn in. And then, of course, uh, on, on their inaugural, they're walking up Pennsylvania Avenue. And this is during the, uh, that's uh, uh, Jenna and Barbara Bush, uh, and grandchildren who later became uh, part of the uh, George W's White House, um, but this is one of the inaugural balls. And then just a shot of Barbara Bush uh, at one of her inaugural balls. Every year, this is the, the Bush family up in uh, Walker's Point in Kennebunkport, Maine, and uh, every year I do a family photo, and we wound up doing this photo, and, and uh, uh, you know, it's it just a, really a lot of fun, but you can see on the left uh, is, is uh, Neil, and, and then Ian is George W. and Laura Bush, and, and Marvin up in the back, and Dora and her husband, and uh, Jeb and his family. Now when you go there, they have actually a little sign that says, warning um, president on Segway. <laughs> Uh, this is with the grandchildren at um, the vice president's house and then with the grandchildren uh, at the White House, and that's the Oval Office in the background. And one of the key things to the, to the Bush family is, is family, faith, and friends, and the loyalty that, that uh, their friends have, and, and I, I saw that over and over and over again, over the many, many years, uh, you know, uh, George Bush was an integral part uh, of the federal government, uh, you know, CIA director, congressman, um, vice president, president, and, and that, that mass of people that he got to know and, and be loyal to. We were at the uh, UN one time in some big conference and we're walking down the hallway and here's these hundreds of uh, folks and and um, there's this one guy standing there on the side and, and the president stops and goes over and greets the guy and he was the janitor but he was the janitor who used to clean his office when he was at the UN and 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 so it was that kind of thing that we always saw uh, in in him um, <laughs> This is the the Bush family in their in their bed in in, uh, in Kenny Bunkport, and and it, it was kind of interesting. Life magazine was looking; uh, uh, they wanted to send a photographer up uh, to take some photos, and the Bushes said, "Yeah, you know, we're on vacation. We don't want to do anything. Let Dave Valdez take some pictures, and you know, be on your way." And they said, "Well, no, we don't know David." And, and uh, uh, it went back and forth for a few days, and they finally said, "Okay, let's do it." I shot this photo, ran two full pages in Life magazine. What's interesting is, is and it wasn't important until a few years later, but on the left side of the photo, and you don't see it, there is another picture of that, is George W. sitting over there with Jeb. And you know who would have known then that he would have been the next president? Vice President Bush traveled to um, Poland, uh, uh, when it was communist and met with shipyard worker Lech Walesa, and Lech Walesa said, someday you, George Bush, will be president of the United States, 
and someday Poland will be free. Well, we went back a few years later with President Bush and met with President Lech Walesa of a free Poland. And for me, it was an interesting experience to uh, work for the vice president, see some of the things he was working on, and then go back as president. <coughs> of course, um, uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait, and um, um, this was actually the moment uh, when the foreign minister from Iraq was at a press conference and said, now we're, uh, uh, we're not pulling out of Kuwait, and um, this is actually um, in, in a room just off the Oval Office that you know, we've all been in many, many times. Um, but it was interesting to be watching that moment happen because that was kind of the moment where they said, well, you know, I guess we're gonna have to go do something. This is upstairs in the residence uh, of the White House. Uh, Colin Powell, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs, giving a briefing, and Brent Scowcroft there, and Governor Sununu, and Dan Quayle, and, and Marlon Fitzwater, and, and that's Bob Gates there in the foreground. And then George Bush had been, uh, was the youngest Navy fighter pilot in, in World War II, and was shot down and, and lost his crew. And so now as commander in chief, he's making a, uh, a decision to send uh, young folks off to war. And, and this was on the South Lawn just a couple of hours before they kind of pulled the trigger on that. Uh, didn't really take that long to get uh, um, Iraq out of Kuwait, and this is Colin Powell uh, uh, talking to Norman Schwarzkopf, kind of there at the end of, of the uh, Gulf War. Um, President Clinton congratulating former President Bush, and um, uh, at that moment I was unemployed, but I went ahead and took the picture. <laughs> and then I saw David's picture earlier, and so I was fortunate to have the opportunity to take a similar picture. And I know Pete Souza uh, did the same thing for President Reagan. Um, family was such an important part of, of um, and it always has been since, since day one, if, if you read any of the books on, on, on the Bush family. So he was so proud of his sons. This is uh, Jeb being sworn in as governor of Florida. I was given the opportunity to, to photograph that. And then uh, George W. and, and his dad uh, uh, down in Houston, Texas. And, and then George W. and, and Laura Bush, uh, their uh, first inaugural. And, th and then just out of uh, the clear blue sky, I get a call to photograph the funeral of Coretta Scott King. And uh, uh, you can see President Bush, President Clinton, President Bush, President Carter were all uh, at the service. That was really quite a, quite a couple of days for me. And of course, you've all you've all heard about the president doing his skydiving, and so so that's uh, w one of the last uh, photos that I've taken of him. Well, good evening. I'm Bob McNeely. Uh, I had the opportunity to follow David and the other David and a couple of other great photographers into the White House. Um, and I want to thank uh, Don Carlton and Mark Updegro for this opportunity. This is just really a, a place where photography is appreciated and uh, really venerated. One of the things when we work there, of course, is um, our work isn't seen immediately. Occasionally, a few images, if there's something that they can't bring the press in or they need to get a picture out, we'd put something out. But a lot of our imagery is made for history. So these kind of opportunities after the fact to show the work and then to go back. I wanna, it's just been a real enjoyable thing for me. I went back in and redid, I had sort of a couple shows I've done, but I went back in and looked for some historical imagery um, for this, cause I, you know, just kind of understood that it would be kind of the audience to, under, to see the history and what we were doing there and how later, just like in Okamoto's pictures, which are such an inspiration. I mean, they set this standard that you always are, going to try to work just a little harder. It's years later that these pictures really start to reflect. And when you're there, I think 
you, you know, you can get the sense from us. Stuff goes by very quickly, and you're not really listening to it all or trying to sort it all out, but you have this opportunity to make this imagery and then go through it, or the historians will go through it, or your great-great-grandchildren will be, his, you know, will have the opportunity of all of us to, to see this imagery. So I'm going to, in my work, I'm showing mostly black and white. Uh, I sort of took that inspiration from Okamoto, quite literally, so I shot mostly black and white. Uh, this is the first picture I took of, of Bill Clinton in the campaign, actually in 91. Uh, I w was photographing this uh, debate and just walked on, to, I was standing around the set and he came out and I had no idea, I'd know, I sort of knew who he was, I mean running as governor, but sitting there adjusting his tie, sort of in his, uh, just at that point, I mean, there's sort of a something about his kind of sense of, of his organization and his approach and, and his political senses. And this is a picture of the cover of my book. Um, one of the things I like to do in working and was able to do, and everybody's talked a little bit about how they were offered the job. I had worked in his campaign and went into the White House, uh, was you know offered the job from being the campaign photographer, but they really didn't know what to expect. One, as, as being president, as no one would, or what it meant to have someone like myself with a bunch of cameras following him around all day, sort of sticking them in his face. And about the second day, our big talk about what I was gonna do came on about the second day when I had not left his side. I was sort of Velcroed there, and every time he'd turn his head or do something, I'd click another frame. And he said, Bob, I mean, this is like, you're on top of me all the time. Is this, is how long is this gonna go on? So I said, well, sir, you know, I feel this real historical responsibility. I mean, this is the presidency. Um, it's, you know, we're doing this for history, and I just worry about missing something. So, I mean, I'd like to work this way, but if I get too close or if it gets too much or, you know, you feel it's, it's infringing on, you know, you in some way, please say something. So there was a, you know, a couple beat pause and he thought, he says, okay, you know, that's fair. And then in the six years that I photographed him, there were only two times that whatever was going on or whatever his sense of uh, his own ability to focus, he asked me just to, to back off. And, and uh, actually he asked me twice and uh, Francois Mitterrand asked me once to, to leave the room. <laughs> but I'm just gonna go through these fairly quickly. Uh, and talk about just real quickly sort of the, the themes here. As I said, this is Clinton very close. I actually didn't stay this close to him all the time. Uh, this is with a 28 millimeter. Anybody who's a photographer knows I was probably, he had, was walking into the Oval Office and had turned to say something to someone just about bumping, me bumping into him or knocking me over, but I was able to get the camera up and frame this shot and uh, you know, just it all came together. This is early in his presidency uh, when, yes, it was as chaotic as you'd heard. This is before his first address to the nation. There's about three minutes to live air behind the Oval Office desk, and you can see everybody's got an idea of how to do it. And I love that in the back corner, you can see the White House steward who had been there with um, President Bush, and I'm sure he's looking in there saying, boy, these guys are just weird. Look at them, you know, the, just the chaos and the noise. But Clinton was very comfortable with that. I mean, the, the idea, this is a meeting on Somalia uh, during the uh, whole, whole crisis that became the movie Black Hawk Down, uh, National Security Council, uh, once again, Alan Greenspan, uh, at this point still the, uh, one of the masters of the universe. A little older though than in David's picture. This is just a, a meeting in the Oval Office. I always think of this picture, it's like when you walk into a room and you think everybody's been talking about you, you know, as you come through the door. <laughs> one of the things is listening to David and of course listening to Dave Valdez and stuff, Obviously, there's a lot of enjoyment in this work, and there is humor, and, and going back now, some of these, these pictures, I mean, there's some pictures of here. I mean, there is serious business, and you do make the serious historical, but occasionally, I mean, we all, like, you know, I have a couple in here that are kind of just more for the laughs, but this is an economics meeting. One of the things is the president is always the center of attention, which is one of the things I think it's missed in some of the ideas about uh, the presidency. Someone asked me one time about the TV show West Wing and how close that was to the, what I had seen in the White House. And I said the real difference was that there's only one important person in the real White House, and that's the president. I mean, all these peripheral stories, everything all the time kind of revolves around him. 
This is after uh, the first vo uh, vote on his economic policy. This is up in the residence. Uh, the vote is there on the uh, TV screen. And that's Mac McClarty, his first chief of staff. You can just see how, every, how he's keying and vice president's keying off the president's mood. This picture, and I hope you can read that, this is the vice president pointing out that they can get free 15-inch monitors for everyone in the White House and in the federal government. It's all very serious, I think, about these monitors. <laughs> And this is uh, the second chief of staff, Leon Panetta, who brought order out of chaos in the White House. He was really an extraordinary chief of staff and has gone on to be um, Barack Obama's head of the CIA. And one of the things, as with David and, and David Valdez, you see these people that start in the government and then sort of grow. And as you're photographing, there's sort of this sense of making all these pictures and, and why are you doing it? Well, a lot of times they become sort of a illumination for the, some of the later things they do, like David's wonderful pictures of Rumsfeld and Cheney. I mean, they've obviously gone on to a little more acclaim. And I, I've always liked this picture. It's sort of like the, the, the Three Stooges reading the president's notes there. If there was one more guy, he'd be falling over at the end. It, it'd be. Now, this is, this is a, a moment when the president is, actually, is listening to George Stephanopoulos. This is a moment when George is listening to the president. <laughs> Making this picture, I'll just uh, have to tell this. I'm, I'm standing there, and President Clinton had a very volatile temper. I mean, he'd get himself worked up quickly and then cool off quickly, but obviously it was one of those things, you know, how to photograph it. I mean, you didn't really, but I was, happened to be standing there and he'd gotten himself worked up about something that was in the press that day, and he's saying it to George, and I'm standing there thinking, I really want to take this picture. And if he sees me do it, I'm in real trouble. So, I, and I had my Leica, which is very small and quiet, and very slowly brought it up, took one frame and took it down. I, I apologize for cutting off his arm up there. I didn't spend a lot of time composing the picture, it could, but I sort of, I think I caught the uh, emotion of the moment. And George again. <laughs> I, I think when this started, he may have been sitting up in the chair and he slowly started <laughs> sliding down in the seat. <laughs> and this is another, I mean, this is the thing that I think what we do though, that eventually is gonna be valuable in this work. Obviously, the, there's a lot of history and there's like David's picture of Mayaguez and the Desert Storm and um, everything, but this understanding of who they were as people and, and you know, kind of their interactions. Now this is a little sequence, that's Rahm Emanuel, uh, who's now the White House Chief of Staff. This is after Rahm was able to get the first major gun control bill had been passed in the House, in the Senate, and in the, in the Congress for years, which after this led to the, you know, the 94 congressional elections where the Republicans took over. But at this point it was a very, and there's a whole little sequence here of Rahm, who of course now is, you know, has gone on to, you know, he's, he's doing his best. This is a little portrait of Rahm from that time. Rahm in the Oval Office, Madeleine Albright. Here's Rahm, and this is Tony Blair, of course, uh, after Tony Blair had become the uh, Prime Minister. Now there's a little sequence here of four. This is the thing that Bill Clinton was very good at. This is the Mideast peace process had bogged down, so uh, after Netanyahu is now the Prime Minister of Israel again, uh, had come into office after Rabin and had been assassinated and they'd finally had elections with Arafat and they would, had stopped talking to each other so King Hussein and, and President Clinton had gotten this idea to bring him to Washington and here's Netanyahu speaking and then Arafat speaking, trying to bring them together. It didn't work this time. I mean, they stayed way, way apart and of course Clinton didn't have a lot of success ultimately in Middies Peace but this these next two pictures, this is in Northern Ireland uh, where he did have more success. We went there on a trip and f the first time ever brought the Protestants and the Catholics together but not at the same time. Um, they had a reception and it went on for two hours. The first hour, Ian Paisley and uh, his supporters showed up and they went into this room and sat there. 
And then the next hour, Jerry Adams came in and they sat there, but it was an opportunity to, to talk. And they literally were in the same chair within hours of each other, but they would not appear together. But it was getting over that bridge and you know that seems to have achieved lasting peace. It's one of the things I think Clinton is probably the most proud of. This is a picture with Slobodan Milosevic at uh, Paris signing of the Dayton Peace Accords. And of course later, you know, we would send airstrikes against Serbia and he would be tried as a, a war criminal. Now this is a picture of, of the uh, president of China. I, I just like this, it's just like, you know, doesn't he know about $400 haircuts? I mean, <laughs> it's like, who cuts that guy's hair? And this is, um, this is a photographer in, from the 20s named Eric Solomon. When the Leica camera was first developed to shoot what was then 35 millimeter movie film. And he was an aristocrat in Europe and started going to events. And he has wonderful pictures of, of diplomatic things and the, the ascent of, of Nazism. And, and his pictures, I mean, this had this, I, one of the reasons I like this picture, I sort of felt the connection to Solomon and kind of the sense. This is at a G8 meeting uh, in Denver. Of course, Helmut Kohl, uh, Chirac, Yeltsin, uh, Prime Minister of Canada. Uh, now, Richard Nixon visiting the White House the early days of the Clinton presidency. He came in one evening and they talked. He wanted to talk about foreign policy and he, he passed away not too long after this. This is my five presidents picture. Uh, for NAFTA, the White House. This is one of those kind of funny moments. We all experience them. You're in a room and then you, nobody knows what to say. Nobody knows quite what to do. Um, I, I love President Bush in the back. He's like, didn't I, what did I have in that corner? I had something different over there. <laughs> This is a little series, the, the, two, the relationship that shaped those middle years were, of course, with the Republican Congress, the shutdown of the government. This is, of course, Newt Gingrich, a couple of Southern boys here eating a little barbecue, <laughs> talking. But they had, a, it was interesting, that whole shutdown government time and the back and forth and, and, of course, all the different things that led to. And each time they'd come down to negotiate on the, the government, Clinton would just weave that Clinton-esque spell over, over Newt and he would sort of agree to a bunch of stuff and then go back up to the hill and all his freshmen would say, you're crazy, we're not gonna deal with that guy and the government would stay shut down. Of course, listening to Newt, you can see Bob Rubens really thinks that's a good idea that Newt's coming up with. <laughs> Now, they, these are two pictures I made on Air Force One. Sometimes, I mean, as I said, we make these historical images that 10, 20 years later, uh, we flew over after uh, Prime Minister Rabin was assassinated to Israel for the funeral. It was a very august group on the plane, uh, President Bush, President Carter. At that point, uh, you know, Newt was Speaker of the House. Um, Bob Dole was, was gonna, the majority leader of the, of the Senate. And uh, this is on the way over, and then later on there was a, a meeting to go over details of what the, the funeral would be like and everything at Dennis Ross, who's still, uh, but anyway, and here's Newt. And uh, after we returned from this trip, it was one of those really quick, uh, all of these other gentlemen can tell you some of the travel, presidential travels. You fly to Israel all night for the day, for a funeral, for a quick series of meetings, get back on the plane and fly home. And on the way, into work the next morning, I had the car radio on and listening to NPR, the morning news, and they're saying uh, Newt Gingrich had said that uh, the reason he shut down the government, well, and this was actually, it must have been a couple days later, the reason he had shut down the government was that he and, and Bob Dole had been ignored on the flight to Israel. That they, they'd just been snubbed and treated so badly. So I went in and, and saw Mike McCurry and I said, Mike, I have these pictures of, of the president talking to Newt and Bob Dole and everything. And Mike, very, he's a very cagey guy, said, well, Bob, why don't you make a few prints and see if anybody might want them? <laughs> so I, I called down to the lab and had a stack of prints made and walked into the, they made a quick announcement, uh, White House press office into the press room and I walked in with a stack of prints and pretty soon, I mean, they're flying in every direction and people are grabbing them. And by the, it took me 30 seconds to get back to my office and Wolf Blitzer's on the White House lawn holding up these pictures showing the, the president. Well, about two weeks after that, 
I'm in the Oval Office at the end of a meeting and I see this scene here, not knowing quite what it is, but of course it's a mix. I was actually on the other side of the room when Clinton shook hands with Newt and Gore shook hands with Dole, and I knew what was coming next, so I sort of flew around to the other side, made this picture. Um, the next day I'm coming back into work and I hear on the radio, they've um, had made a deal last night to open the government and it had fallen through. The, the Republicans said, we're not going to do it now or the deal had, wasn't sufficient or something. And so I went and saw Mike again and says, Mike, I got a picture of them agreeing to the deal. <laughs> so I, I took that into the press room again. And as a result, the next time they were coming down to negotiate, the word came down from, uh, from the, the president's office from Mike, the Republicans won't come if we take any more pictures of them. <laughs> This is a little sequence sort of, of of just presidential stuff. This is the president walking in to see the Christmas tree. Uh, each year they decorate a big tree in the blue room. It's unveiled the night of the Kennedy Center Honors and the president first lady walked in and I'm just, I watch him walk in and he stands there. You can sort of, in his body language, there's a, a lot about Bill Clinton. It was a, a little boy. So he walked in and, you know, he's looking at his tree and behind him the first lady walks in, starts rearranging it. <laughs> Then this is just a little sequence of Mrs. Clinton, obviously a very important person, you know, and it's going to be, but interesting lady. I mean, I liked her a lot, very bright, but had her own attitudes towards things, always feeling a little on the edge. This is during health care. This is on the way up to, for him to deliver his health care speech, which obviously she was very involved in. The first you know, big event, a big attempted health care in the last few years, which didn't go very well. Now this is after his first State of the Union. Um, very, you know, affectionate, warm picture. The next, this picture is on the way to his State of the Union three weeks after the Monica Lewinsky uh, <laughs> scandal had started to unfold. There's a saying in the military, a thousand yard stare. I think Rahm and Mrs. Clinton both have that stare. There was just such a, I mean, just, oh my God. I mean, how many things have we lived through and now? And the president at the same time, sort of like, he's just within himself. There's a, a whole sense there. This picture then, after the one before, I was going through my stuff. This is a picture during the, the problems with the travel office when the president first came into office. Uh, the gentleman on the right is Vince Foster, who shortly after this picture killed himself. But it's that same, th there's a period in Washington when things really get out of control and there's just, there's just no sense of, of I don't know, I mean, what's going to come out of it. And this was, and what I, one of the interesting sort of things is at this point is the president leaving the room. He's sort of like, hey, this is your guy's problem. I had nothing to do with the travel office. And this is another pair. This is 1997, about to go on the uh, South Lawn for an event. This is the summer of 98 when the Lewinsky affair was about to become, just come to a head. And at the same time, this is a moment in the Oval Office. Very unusual, the First Lady never, I never ever saw her sit in those chairs. Those were always like for the President and the Vice President and stuff. But this, towards the end of this particular meeting, she came in and sat there and it just was, I thought, an interesting portrait of their relationship. And the President after the last campaign in 96. Thank you very much. I actually pushed this button. I don't know if I should have. I pushed this red button. Okay. Do I get back to Briscoe? Okay, here you go. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I want to thank everyone at the uh, LBJ Library for inviting me here to speak. And uh, nearly nine years ago, uh, here in Austin, I interviewed for the White House job and actually just not too far away from here at the, the Bush campaign headquarters. And during that interview, I'll never forget what Chief of Staff Andy Carr told me. He said that working at the White House was like trying to drink water through a fire hose at full throttle. <laughs> and he was right. So let me throw some events at you. 9-11, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, the Columbia Space Shuttle disaster, 
funerals for two presidents and a pope, another close presidential election, the largest natural disaster in U.S. history, the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. I traveled to nearly 70 countries with President Bush, 49 states, sorry Vermont. <laughs> During my eight years, I made nearly one million images in the White House. And for all you techie, techies out there, the storage for the entire digital photo database came in around 50 terabytes. As a photojournalist, I relished the surprise moments of capturing those, those moments that you just can't plan for. <laughs> Sometimes you get lucky. This is at the ranch in Crawford, Texas. And I did have moments where I could prepare for, for example, day one of the administration. This is President Bush entering the Oval Office for the very first time as the 43rd president. And this was also my very first time in the Oval Office. And I may be the first person to enter the Oval Office walking backwards, because that's what I had to do in order to get this picture. The first signature as president. <laughs> this is the first couple at the end of the night on inauguration evening uh, 2001. And uh, just so there's some context to this picture, this is at the end of the night uh, and the president and Mrs. Bush attended nearly 22 inaugural balls. The first landing of Marine One on the South Lawn. But nothing could compare, prepare me for September 11th, 2001. I was with the president at the elementary school in Sarasota, Florida. And approximately 9.14 a.m. when this photo was taken, uh, and this is minutes after Andy Card whispered in the president's ear, uh, a second plane hit the tower, America is under attack. And the president walked into the hold room and immediately walked to the corner of the room, grabbed um, a notepad and started writing. And I was waiting for him to look up to see what was going on on the television, but he never did. And it wasn't until um, 917 that the president was notified by communications director Dan Bartlett, who alerted everyone to the television screen. And the president sees, for the very first time, the images of Flight 175 hitting the South Tower. At this stage, everything was focused on the horrific events playing out in New York City. No one knew the scope of what was to come. Aboard Air Force One, 10 a.m., approximately 10 a.m., the vice president has been evacuated from the West Wing to a secure location. Flight 77 has crashed into the Pentagon. Flight 93 has been hijacked. The entire U.S. airspace has been shut down. The discussion aboard the plane turned to the president's safety. The president really wanted to get back to Washington at this time, but he was advised against it. And my experience on the plane, uh, I remember this one moment uh, when there were lots of false reports flying around the plane like a, a, a car bomb at the State Department, a fast moving object headed toward the president's ranch in Crawford. And at one moment, the president came out of the cabin and said, I just, I just heard that Angel is the next target, and Angel is the code name for Air Force One. Approximately 9.20 a.m., Flight 93 has crashed. Approximately 10.30, actually there's a slide missing there, unfortunately. Um, 
Our first stop was Barksdale Air Force Base, and uh, Air Force One was quickly surrounded by armed personnel, and the staff and the press, we were all ushered into buses while the president boarded an arm, armored Humvee. This is also where the president received his first full briefing on the status of the attacks via teleconference. We were there at Barksdale Air Force Base for about two hours and the president did another uh, address or a, a taped statement that was later sent out to the media. Later that afternoon, our second stop was off at Air Force Base in Nebraska, where the president received a top secret briefing from his military commanders in, inside this room. Back aboard the plane, uh, after we left Nebraska, we learned that we were finally headed back home to Washington. And this image shows the Air Force One crew uh, trying to get some information about what was happening back at home. And uh, this is the time when, uh, before Air Force One was equipped with, with satellite TV, and in order for the airplane to receive reception, we had to fly over a major metropolitan city. So it made the day even more surreal as the news would, would fade in and fade out and uh, we get just little bits and pieces of what was happening. The president on the phone with the vice president. The president comforting Harriet Myers, who was the staff secretary at the time. And on our approach, to Andrews Air Force Base, the president and the staff noticed the F-16 fighter jets escorting us back to Washington. This scene made me feel like we were truly at war. Back at the White House, inside the PIOC, the Presidential Emergency Operations Center, discussing the situation with Vice President Cheney. The next morning, September 12th, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice watches the sunrise as the President speaks to Prime Minister Tony Blair on the phone about the situation. Also the same day, the President visited the Pentagon to thank fire and rescue crews. September 14th, the day of national prayer. This was the moment right after the president addressed uh, and he delivered his remarks at the National Cathedral and his father reached out to grab his hand. Also on September 14th, the president traveled to New York City to visit Ground Zero. This is a, image was made aboard Marine One as we flew over the Pentagon on the way to Andrews Air Force Base for the trip. And the president is looking out at the damage of the Pentagon. And also, you may notice, this is the first day that the president started wearing the flag pin. Ground Zero in New York City. For weeks after I made this photo, I, I never realized that they're actually standing on a fire truck that was crushed. The President spent nearly three hours meeting with the families of the World Trade Center victims. This was probably the toughest situation I've ever had to photograph in in all my eight years at the White House. There was intense sorrow and sadness. Um, the families carried photos of, of their, the, the missing. Um, they also carried signs of their names, uh, of their loved ones. Signs that said, uh, have you seen my mother? Have you seen my brother? Have you seen my aunt? It was, it was very, very hard to lift the camera. And I, I probably only made just two or three images uh, during this scene. It was, it was very, very uh, emotional. <coughs> September 20th, the first face-to-face -face meeting with Prime Minister Tony Blair. This is also the evening that the President addressed the nation uh, during a joint session of Congress about the 9-11 attacks. First week in October, 
a CIA briefing led by CIA Director George Tenet on the right, and this is at Camp David. October 7th, the President collects his thoughts before addressing the nation about the start of the, the war in Afghanistan. The President holds the badge of fallen Port Authority Officer George Howard, given to him by his mother during his trip to Ground Zero. The President carried this badge everywhere in the days and the weeks that followed 9-11. And I felt it was extremely important to, to show this badge and to show it in his hand. So one day I, I asked the President if I can photograph the badge and he said, he said simply yes. And um, he pulled it out of his pocket and I made my picture. Thank you. I'm Don Carlton, the director of the Briscoe Center, and I really want to give these guys another hand. They're just I also want to second what my good friend Mark Updegrove said uh, about how delighted uh, I think we are mutually. Mark and I have been friends for about 10 or 12 years, I guess now. And uh, this is just, uh, we've got uh, a lot of potential to do some great programming like we've done uh, tonight with the Briscoe Center and the LBJ Library, and we're really looking forward to, to more of this. And I do want to add uh, what Mark said about the Walter Cronkite program. We've got some really wonderful things coming up this year uh, related to Walter Cronkite, and we hope all of you are able to come back and join us. Now, as you are all aware, I'm sure, this is the first anniversary of President Obama's inauguration. So this is one of the reasons that Mark and I felt it would be very uh, uh, timely to have this kind of a program. You see photographs on the screen of the, or should be anyway, of the Obama uh, inauguration. We have two uh, of the photographers who are with us right now, uh, Dave uh, uh, Kennerly and Bob McNeely, who work together on a project to photograph the inauguration. And so we're going to ask uh, for questions uh, from the audience, but I'm going to start off the questions by asking the first one. And I'm going to ask uh, Bob McNeely and uh, Dave Kennerly to tell us what their favorite moments were uh, as they were working on this project uh, to document the Obama inauguration. You guys want to take a shot at that? Uh, sure. <clears throat> Uh, McNeely and I uh, worked on the project. We had a, a almost, I guess there were 20 photographers all in. Um, <clears throat> really good shooters at every place um, uh, on the hill. Uh, I chose to stay down at the White House. Uh, we had a uh, photographer up in the head-on position. We were also set to the official White House photographers. We did the book for the um, uh, Presidential Inaugural Committee. <clears throat> so we had excellent access uh, to the events. But my, my favorite pictures were, you saw one in the elevator with the Clintons, or the Clintons, see how quickly they forget, <clears throat> with the Obamas in the elevator um, that really showed their relationship uh, to me. But earlier I, I photographed uh, President George W. Bush leaving the White House and he never looked back. And it was one of those incredible moments that uh, McNeely was talking about it earlier, described it better than I did with Bush looks like he's had it, that's enough of this. Uh, he never looked back. <clears throat> Obama is coming around the car, which is the last time he'll ever do that as president because normally the president gets right into the car directly. Um, and there's a young man who's taking over the, uh, the reins. And I've been to five of those transitions, and one of the great things about our country is the peaceful um, uh, transfer of power. And uh, the, this particular transition was really smooth that George W. Bush mandated that, uh, that the doors were open to the uh, uh, Obama people. And uh, there were, 
but those two photos for me really kind of underscored the day. The one was at the very end uh, of the day in the elevator. And um, one, another you saw up there was the Obamas coming into the White House for the first time at the end of the inaugural balls uh, to spend their first night as the first family. One of the things that I've, I've talked to a little bit about on that inaugural a couple times, I had, I had lived in Washington for about 30 years uh, from 72 to 2000, a little 2001. And uh, for me, I spent the inaugural day while David was nice and warm inside the White House. I was out on the mall and it was about 10 degrees, but I really wanted to be part of this, this celebration of Washington. Uh, that city, uh, the people who live there day in, day out, uh, not as opposed to the transitory, the, the media, the, the politicians, the people that come and go from somewhere else, the people that call Washington home have, it's gone through, it's, gone through quite a transition. I mean, it's a lot better, but for a long time it was it was under the the, the direction of, of some of these old congressional chairmen of, of these committees. It was run as, as sort of um, a second thought. There was no real caring. The schools were bad. I mean, there was just so much of the, for the people that lived there that was an, an African-American community, I should say, as well, a large, large African-American community. So this inaugural for, for Washington was an extraordinary moment. And some of the pictures I made on the mall and the interaction with the people that day, I mean, despite the 10 degrees, I mean, people were out there at 5 in the morning as the sun was coming up. And um, all these older ladies in their, their Sunday best clothes and these thin little shoes, I mean, their dress shoes. And, and just, uh, I was out there and of course, eight layers of thermal wear and, and insulated boots and I was freezing. But, and I made a photograph that's in the book of a, of a father standing there with his young child wrapped in a blanket and had been out there for hours, but wanted his son to be there for this swearing in. And, and this, I mean, obviously it, it didn't, it hasn't made his job any easier. I mean, he doesn't get a pass on being president um, um, in, in any way, but in terms of what it meant in this country and, and what it meant to the city of Washington, that, 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 and it's a very personal thing for me, but it was, it was a big part of that day. Great, Bob. Thanks. You'll notice that Mr. Kennerly, who's been a friend of mine for 35 years, is taking your picture while we were talking, so. They'll be available for $10 a piece after the show. <laughs> That's a great price from him, believe me. <laughs> he, won't sign it. he won't sign it for that, though. Yeah, it's more for the signature. <laughs> okay, we want to take some questions from you, and we have uh, some microphones in the, uh, the aisles here, and so we need for you to go to the mic, make your way uh, to the microphones so that we can uh, get your questions and so that everyone can, can hear them and then we can also record them. Uh, and I think we've got someone coming up here now to ask a question, uh, Henry Bame. Henry? Yes, sir. Don Carlton, we thank you and Mark for a fantastic evening, and we really appreciate what you all have done for us. All right. <clears throat> And Don, my question has to do with the fact that, to me, our newest president, President Obama, and his wife seem to have such a very close relationship. And I'm wondering if any of you all have anything to say about the relationship of each of the presidents with their individual wife. Well, that's a, that's a good one for McNeely, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I showed it. I, I tried to show it in my pictures. I mean, it's a very comp that's probably as complicated a relationship, but the, the Clinton relationship that I've ever seen in my life. I mean, they're both so brilliant. Uh, they're both so hardworking. And I've had people tell me, oh, it's really just a partnership, isn't it? Isn't it? No, it's not. I mean, there's an extraordinary amount of affection there, but also... Uh, an extraordinary amount of disappointment. I mean, Bill Clinton, the, the, part of his charm, it, it's referred to a lot as boyish charm, but <laughs> boys make uh, mistakes. I mean, he's, he's still a boy. And um, that relationship, though, was very warm. I think when they went into the White House, there was a real sense on Mrs. Clinton's part that he'd be 
under lock and key. This was their time and there was a lot of warmth and I think there was a real sort of a, for all of us, I mean, it was a real mystery. How did he get away with that, you know? But all no, of us, he I mean. Did, he didn't, Bob. He didn't get no, away no. with it. Ultimately, he didn't. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, and, and I'll let these other gentlemen talk about what they observed. Well, I, I know in, in my situation, um, fa family was, was a key element to the entire Bush family, and, and I know Eric can contest to this. It, it, it's um, it was it was one of those things that that once once you got on the inside, you were on the inside. And I, I mentioned uh, faith, family, and friendship, and, and loyalty. And, and you know, it started at the core. You know, with, with with George and Barbara Bush, but if you go even back further to George Bush Sr.'s parents and how they raised him, I, 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 saw, I saw that from his childhood and some of the things, you know, he would come home from, from playing soccer as a little boy and say, hey, we won the game. And, and his mother would say, and how did the other team do? How how were they? So it was don't brag on yourself. When when the Berlin Wall came down, you know everybody was saying, "Hey George Bush, you ought to you ought to go and stand on the wall and wave the flag." And he said, "You know it's it, it's not our thing. That's that's for the Germans to celebrate." And, and you know when you take the the family aspect of it and then apply it out into public policy, uh, I saw a real never-ending um, uh, ease of effort on, on, on George Bush's part with, with that. And one of the biggest successes that he always claimed was that his children always came home and, and having the, the love and respect of his children was the most important thing that he accomplished in his great career. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on what David mentioned uh, in terms of George W. Bush and, and the meaning of family um, and including the First Lady, uh, uh, Mrs. Bush. And uh, every year uh, that I was at the White House, every Christmas, the President would uh, have his, fa his family at Camp David and, uh, and it, it, without hesitation, and that was very, very important to him. Um, and for me, uh, as a, a photojournalist, as a, you know, a visual storyteller, it just created another layer uh, of a very interesting uh, part of history to have two presidents together, uh, father and son. Uh, so to me, any time the family was together, uh, you would have, I mean, you know, take for example his, his brother Jeb, you know, uh, and he, he was governor of Florida during that partial time in the White House. And so uh, it just really was a, a treat for me uh, and, and another way to look at, at, at the presidency because of that legacy, because of the, the generational part of, of that story. So it's very, very, very fascinating. David, you were almost a f member of the family of the Fords. Uh, and I know you've got a. I was the one they wouldn't uh, want to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> well, the Fords were extremely close. I, I was just thinking, sitting here at the LBJ, that um, uh, the day that Mrs. Ford went to the hospital, uh, they didn't tell anybody at all about what was going on. And uh, Mrs. Johnson and the two daughters visited Mrs. Ford that day and took a, um, a tour of the White House. Actually, that's one of the pictures of my, uh, uh, the, the book, uh, Extraordinary Circumstances. And Mrs. Ford was very gracious and showed them around, and, but she didn't say anything about it. And when I went back through the photographs, uh, which we all have the advantage of, of doing, and of course all of our pictures were in the presidential uh, archives, I found this picture, and on the, in the, in the Ford's bedroom, there was a, a, a suitcase at the end of the bed, and there was Mrs. Johnson and the two girls and, and uh, uh, having this nice conversation with Mrs. Ford, and there was this suitcase, and that was the suitcase that uh, she took to the hospital with her, and I'll never forget uh, being with President Ford, I was very close. Uh, they certainly treated me like a member of the family, but. Uh, 
when President Ford got the word that she had to have this operation and everything, he was in a room and cried, and, and uh, I did not photograph that. Uh, but it was a really private moment, but they were extremely close. And I, I think um, it was a, a great example for me, and I was brought up by uh, mom and dad who were together the whole time and uh, all of that. But uh, um, I learned a lot from them as a couple and as, a, as family people. And I think a lot of the photographs will really reflect that. I know what, uh, you know, Eric and David and, and uh, certainly the Clintons with their daughter, uh, that's very much part of the mix that we uh, have documented. Uh, right over here, yeah. Where does security enter in? What was your Secret Service handle? <laughs> and did they ever crop, insist on cropping or ch clearing your photographs? Why would they do that? <laughs> Those are bodyguards, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, they had no, we, we worked with them a lot. I mean, we, we actually, I, I don't, I think, I'm not sure, we haven't talked about this, but we would actually go to Beltsville, the Secret Service training place, to get to go through the training with them. Because we were close, they wanted us to be aware of what they were doing, but at the same time, they helped us do our job. I mean, they, we were part of, of what, of around them. And at times, we could be helpful. I mean, if there was uh, any kind of a research thing where they wanted to go back into crowd pictures, I mean, we took... You know, they knew we had pictures of, of rope lines and different things if, at different times to look through them. They'd look through them, but no, there, there was, they were very cooperative and they were, they're great guys. I mean, they're extraordinary human beings. They work very hard in a, in a job that, that you only hear about when they really, when something terrible happens. I want to take uh, this President, opportunity, uh, one second, David, yeah. to recognize uh, someone who should be recognized here tonight, and that is uh, Lucy Johnson Turpin, who is with us. And you had a question that I think. <laughs> Who's in one of my photos? <laughs> I just wanted to tell you the other side of the story. Oh, good. <laughs> I should have called you about this. <laughs> uh, I was obviously one of those daughters that was in the White House. And Mrs. Ford had asked us to come to tea. She had not been there for the dedication of the road that day. And there was nothing particularly uh, unusual about that. The president had come. She'd asked us to come later on that afternoon. It was the divide and conquer story that affects uh, first families always. And we had a delicious time. It was a, a unique experience because uh, we were coming back to the White House and Mrs. Ford was actually letting us uh, see our room, something that you know I had not done uh, since I left. And so it was, it was just thrilling. And we ran home. Uh, I confess to turn on the TV immediately to, 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 to see how the, the, the uh, press had played us out for the dedication of the Grove. And there were no pictures of the dedication of the Grove. There was simply the picture of Mrs. Ford leaving the White House with that suitcase. And my mother and my sister, and I turned to each other and said, Mother and, and, and Betty Ford had been close friends uh, all the way through their congressional time together. And Mrs. Ford didn't need to uh, make any excuses. They could have called and simply said, There's been a change in the schedule and we need you to understand. And we would have understood. And that was an afternoon where uh, you would have uh, thoroughly respected a need for the First Lady to be with just her husband or just her children or just alone or, or doing anything except entertaining us. And I think it tells the story, first obviously, about the extraordinary power of President and Mrs. Ford. It also tells a story about first families. So no matter you know whether you're a Democrat or whether you're a Republican, that sense of shared respect and appreciation for each other's high waterways and a desire to be there and celebrate and comfort each other regardless of what perspective you come from. That sense of fraternity of only us can understand what each other are going through was really quite extraordinary. And that photograph hangs on my wall and reminds me what a privilege it was for me to, to be a part of that uh, uh, by an accident of birth to, <laughs> to, uh, to uh, watch that experience.
extraordinary story in the history. But then I want to say something else to all of you who are out here. We've been talking about the history of uh, the presidency. I'd like to say something about the history of this institution. And I know that Harry Middleton shares my feelings and my beautiful niece here, Catherine Rob does too. All of you tonight are making one of Lady Bird Johnson's fondest dreams come true. You have packed the house. <laughs> 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 I wish that my mother had lived to see this wonderful collaboration. John Carlton didn't tell you that uh, during the last five years, <laughs> and she couldn't speak. And she was legally blind. And she couldn't walk. But she had this vibrant, vibrant mind. And so it was what to do, how to, to keep her from being on the sidelines of life. And she got two degrees at the University of Texas. One was in history, and one was in journalism. And what better preparation would there have been for the life? And so one day I decided, I know what we can do for Mama. We'll take a field trip over to the uh, American History Center at the University. And wasn't that one of the most delicious afternoons either you or I ever had? No, it was. It was amazing. It really was special. So I just want to let you know tomorrow that I think I can maybe speak for Harry and for Catherine to say how to see the two of you collaborating, to see all of you out here, to see the LBJ Library so alive with an appreciation of history and appreciation of country and an appreciation of learning, all of which was what they heard in the movie Johnson. Wanted so much in this place to be. Not just a place that's done, focused on the past, but focused on the future, and focused Thank you. Thank you. That was not a setup, I promise you. <laughs> thank you so thank you so much. We have time for just a couple of quick questions. Dirk Halstead uh, is at the microphone over on this other side. Dirk Halstead, let me just quickly add that Dirk Halstead is also uh, one of the more renowned photographers and photojournalists in the United States who covered the presidency for Time Magazine. Dirk, what is your question? The question is, what happens when the circus leaves town? I, I know that you all had this incredible, intensive assignment 24-7 for a whole administration. And I know what that constitutes in far, as far as your personal life. I know David and I shared a house in Georgetown, and he had the Signal Corps telephones and the phones went directly to the White House. So I do know that after President Ford left the White House and you came back to being an ordinary photographer, I know that was a bit of a wrenching stop. Uh, and I would like to ask all of you, you know, what happens when you've been in the center of all this for so long and all of a sudden it stops? And what are you doing now? Um, I, I, I'll, as a senior member of this group, <laughs> having been on the street the longest, um, it was uh, one of the most difficult things uh, ever for me, and uh, Lucy knows, I mean, but having been in the family there, uh, it's all of a sudden the motorcade screeches to a hop, uh, stop and you're thrown out and you're standing there and the, the motorcade takes off and you're not in it and um, all of a sudden, you have to pay for your phone bills. Uh, all of a sudden, um, you got to stop at red lights. Uh, no more rides on Air Force One. I mean, it was a it was a magical trip for me as a young guy from 
<clears throat> uh, a small town in Oregon. I had no background in the news business uh, or any photography business. And to be sitting there photographing the President of the United States was just one of the uh, huge thrills. I've never taken it for granted. I've always felt honored by it. And when it was over with, it was one of the most difficult things I ever went through. And, and thank God for John Derniak of Time Magazine, who knowing I was depressed about the whole thing, and I, anybody who knows me knows that I'm not a depressed person, um, <laughs> sent me off to the Middle East for three months. Now, some people may say that's not really a good news assignment, <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I went out and, and capitalized on a lot of the contacts that I'd had in the White House with King Hussein of Jordan and Sadat uh, Begin and uh, Israel, uh, Rabin uh, uh, went to Saudi Arabia. It totally got me back into the mainstream, and it was uh, uh, it was one of the best things that ever happened after one of the most difficult. Well, the the um, the last day um, that uh, we were there, uh, you saw the picture in the helicopters. We were leaving. Well, we flew down on on what was the Air Force One, they call it special air mission, whatever, uh, uh, and flew down to Houston. And there, there were some former staff on, on the plane and, and we landed and kind of said goodbye and, and they got in the car and drove off to their new home. And I got back on the plane and flew back to Andrews Air Force Base and there weren't that many people on that plane going back and, and um, uh, I had to go back to the White House because the cameras I had belonged to the White House and I had a pen from the Secret Service and pager and all that stuff. So I had to turn it in. Well, it was 9 or 10 o'clock at night and Bob had already moved into my office. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I turned in all my gear and then the next day, the next morning, um, uh, I was going to do a, uh, an interview on the Today Show about the last day of, of the Bush presidency, and, and, and I went along, and, and uh, Katie Couric was going to do it, and I thought, oh, you know, this is a nice softball interview, but at the last second, Bryant Gummel, at that time it was Bryant Gummel and Katie Couric, he decided he wanted to do the interview, and, and I, I had done a few other interviews on the Today Show and, and some of those things, and and um, so I thought, oh, Bryant Gummel, this may be a little digging. But then I thought, you know, I'm unemployed. I can say whatever I want to say. <laughs> so I went in very relaxed. But but this is interesting. Um, in the green room, uh, before I went out, um, um, uh, they were promoting that I was going to be on, and, and a, and a uh, cameraman from from uh, Florida called the green room. He was an NBC cameraman, and and said, "Hey, I see you're going to be on, and and uh, um, you know what are you going to do?" And I said, "Well, I, you know, at this point, I don't really know. I was kind of negotiating with the Walt Disney Company." And uh, uh, Bryant overheard that, and I thought, oh, you know, he's going to say this on national news that, you know, I'm going to the Walt Disney Company, and 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 of course, at that moment, I hadn't locked it in. Uh, but Bryant said uh, just before we went on the air, he said, you know, I do a golf tournament down in in, in uh, Orlando with the Disney Company, and if you need any help getting a job, I'll help you out. Well, it turned out that I didn't, uh, and I went ahead and, and I took the job uh, uh, as manager of photography for the Walt Disney Company for eight years. But my very first job, that first couple of weeks, I didn't go to the Middle East. I, I actually photographed uh, um, one of the political supporters. His uh, daughter was having her 15th or 16th birthday, and I was the photographer for for this girl's birthday party. <laughs> so, so, so kind of a yeah, yeah, you know, and I'm, I'm like, it was an experience. Um, <laughs> But, but, you know, then going to the Walt Disney Company it was just this incredible experience. I, I, you know, when I was at the White House, digital photography was just coming along and, and Kodak had just invented uh, uh, fo Kodak photo CDs and, and, and the, you know, they had introduced me to all that technology and I was thinking, wow, you know, we get reelected, I'm going to go digital. 
and and I wanted to get everything scanned. And well, when we didn't win, um, I had this core knowledge, and I went to the Walt Disney Company, and and uh, they were still shooting. There was advertising photography and publicity photography with a strong emphasis on the advertising, and and I actually steered them into uh, uh, creating a, a digital imaging department where we could create all those uh, uh, neat Disney ads. So so that was a real change, and it took me a while to 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 switch over from pure documentary photography to if you can think it up, we can create it kind of imagery. Um, you came up with the avatar <laughs> idea, right? <laughs> well, well, well. You, you, know, you know, it's interesting. Uh, when, when, um, uh, <laughs> when, when Disney was was starting to to partner with Pixar and doing Toy Story was about the time we started getting into digital imaging, and and we shared some some ideas there. So so you know there there was some of that going on. So it was interesting. Um, you know, these days I, I went back to the federal government. Uh, I'm, you know, there for right now and we'll see what the future brings. Well, to wrap it up, Bob and Eric, you want to tell us what's happening to you? Well, it's just uh, one of the things Dirk sort of hits on, the, the abruptness of it's amazing. One minute you can take, you drive down to work, you drive on to West Exec, which is the, the street between the executive office building and the White House. They swing you through the gate, you get your parking place, you walk out a couple feet and right into the Oval Office with your cameras and start shooting film. Uh, people are waiting there to take it and develop it and print it and all the pictures you want. And then the next day, you know, it's, it's basically... Um, none of that exists. I mean, you're back to doing it all on your own and all the pictures, and it's, 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 it's very difficult. It's one of the great jobs for someone who likes to shoot lots of pictures and likes to have um, you know, a, a front row seat on history, and it's one of those jobs that you know, there's really no way to prepare for it other than just being interested in history and, and being at the right place at the right time. And then and when it's over, it, it, it's, it's, you can't it can't be relived. I mean, you've kind of got to move on fairly quickly. And um, I think that's what we all try to do. I mean, you, you walk out the door and you try to go back to taking pictures and making good ones and then en enjoy what you've done. And that's, I want to thank everyone again for getting to come back here and, and look at these pictures and have a reason to go back through them because it's, there's a million images there as, as I was amazed by um, Eric's story of how many he took. Because as everyone knows now in digital people, there's just so many more images. So it's, it's, uh, but historically, it's it's one of those opportunities that's just just amazing, and it, it you get it, it you know. And the gentleman who's doing it now, Pete Sous, is doing a wonderful job. There's going to be a great archive with um, the Obama material. Well, it's uh, <clears throat> it's been exactly one year <laughs> since <laughs> since uh, my last day in the White House, <laughs> and uh, I can truly say, just like. Um, uh, David said uh, in terms of how difficult it is and uh, you know a year later I'm still in that depressed state that you described <laughs> I'm still in but depressed. one of the things I wanted to do was was get my head and my body completely out of the beltway and out of Washington so I moved back to New Mexico to the high desert for starters to uh, basically recover uh, and now um, I'm basically uh, open to uh, the best opportunity that I can, that I can find. <laughs> so I'm, I'm waiting for that. <laughs> but uh, it's hard to top. I mean, you can't really uh, compare the White House job to anything. It, it's, it's, it's such a unique experience. Uh, uh, it's, it's certainly uh, I, I, the best job for a photographer in the world. We're going to be wrapping up because we want to give you plenty of time to go and enjoy this wonderful reception that we have in store for you in the great hall of this building. And as you leave the uh, room, we would appreciate it if you would go out the rear, uh, to, the, to the rear here. And I'd like to, uh, again, thank these fine guys uh, for being here and sharing these stories with us. <laughs>